I love an intimate group. I think it's perfect. Um, my name's Ephraim. I'm the curator of uh, the show River Factory in the Flesh. Um, I want to thank you all for coming to hear these two amazing, wonderfully important human beings talk. Um, wait. Wait, wait. Yeah. yeah. I'm a Gemini. Am I in the wrong place? Yeah. <laughs> um, this is making my nerves. You. This is making my nerves go away. I mean, really. <laughs> well, I'm excited for it. I don't know. Maybe we'll have a fist fight. I think it'd be that would be fun, right? <laughs> my money's on Ellen. Um, I wrote a really short introduction, but I'm going to go for them. Um, Ellen Carey is Ellen Carey is a lens-based artist. She's an educator, curator, scholar, and a thief. Her works have been shown in collections in permanent and private collections and foundations nationally and internationally. Her works are in and have been shown in galleries, fairs, and institutions such as MoMA's PS1, Museum at the Chicago Art Institute, Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Sao Paulo Biennale, the Museum of Canadian Contemporary Art, m and Galleries in Los Angeles. The list of her accomplishments and houses of her works continues in this way. <laughs> Ellen is a scholar and an artisan. Her works are of the body as much as they are of organism, perhaps not outwardly so at first. Spend time with her abstractions. They become humanistic, both in size and candor. The gesture is, as, is, is rich as much as it is photogenic in her imagery. There's rejection of convention, and the process obscures the nature and association of the camera. The compositions become new in their unexpected nature. They are not of fools, but are of mind and matter. Hmm. Even Fraley. <laughs> uh, that's how I started. I didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Period. 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 Yeah. Stephen received his BA from Bennington College. He is currently the chair of the BFA Photography and Video Department at the School of Visual Arts. <coughs> He's also the co-chair of the NPS Fashion Photography Program at SBA. That's something I didn't know that I find really interesting, and I think it's totally awesome. What? Um, he, he founded the Auction for Photographic mm. Education in Afghanistan to create a photography department in Kabul University. Yes. And I just don't know if I have time to do all that. Um, in 2007, he founded a contemporary photography magazine, Dear Dave, and is currently the editor in chief. Mm. Stephen. All the through so far. <laughs> This second part is going to deny. Um, <laughs> Stephen is a great artist. His work has been exhibited at 303 Gallery, Julie Saw Gallery, and group exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art, International Center of Photography, and the National Museum of American Art. His works ascend peculiarly. In a somewhat debauched way, his imagery plays on the amusement and comedy of antiquity. In his arrangement and under the guise of his mystery, the objects in his photographs become otherly. And they're not in this incarnation of new flesh, but one day I'd like them to be. May I get a copy of this? Hi, Stephen. Hi, uh, but I just I want to thank Ephraim also for putting, first of all, putting together a splendid show and writing a, a really insightful and deeply, um, deeply challenging and uh, interesting essay. And also for having us here. Thank you all for coming. And thank you too. I have to admit, when I read your proposal, I was with my girlfriend Patricia Hinton, who's the curator at the library, and I said, "Could you read? Could you read through this?" Because I hadn't thought about the way you're thinking about new flesh. So it was Excellent. really. <laughs> I I said, you know, I read it through three times, and I thought it was so interesting. You know, I was raised Catholic, so the word flesh was completely taboo. You know, I call it the floating head religion, where you weren't going to talk about anything below your head. Um, but, um, so this idea of the new flesh, I thought was very provocative, but very, uh, had lots of interesting, especially at this intersection in the 21st century, where there's so much talk, and not only in the political arena, but, you know, around gender and identity and, you know, what is the photograph, you know, is it a narrative, is it a document, is it a record, so, but anyway, thank you for having me, and Mike Tan and Robert Patrick fans, so. New and old. Well, um, why don't we start, where should we start, Ellen? I, 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 I mean, maybe a place to start is my pleasure in seeing your work 
included in this context. One of the, one of the I, I think, great curatorial efforts, one of the things that occurs with them is that you see someone's work in a new context and with, with a new slate of, of ideas. So I think at first I was a little puzzled about your, the inclusion of your work in the show, but, the, but I also find it a bit revelatory and, and it gives me a new sense of uh, some ideas and issues in your work. Well, when I think of the Polaroid, the fabulous, fabulous invention mm -hmm. of Dr. Edward Land, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And how lucky mm -hmm. we are mm -hmm. to have him uh, come upon us and, and right after the war, uh, 1945, I believe was the time that he came up with this idea of peel apart, can't get any, you know, a little bit more um, fleshy than that. But I think also the camera, the big Polaroid 2024 camera, is circa 1980. So a lot of people ask me about this, this camera. And of course, Stephen was in Soho, uh, was initially up at the Museum of Fine Arts across the street, the School of. And it was um, the 40, uh, 4080 camera, which is like a camera obscura. But the 2024 started this Polaroid artist support program. And I believe, and John Ritter probably would, could account for this to be true, that I'm the only artist that keeps the negative. So this idea of the peel apart, the positive, you know, it's the negative to the positive transfer process, which echoes, of course, William Henry Fox Talbot, the negative to the positive. Um, it really did give our medium a really big uh, different form of expression. It, it, people didn't know what the object was. I mean, it was color, it was Polaroid, you know, it smelled different, you didn't need a dark room. So I think looking at the positive and the negative together and then going towards abstraction and minimalism. And in fact, this particular artwork, um, I've developed a whole sort of repertoire of inventive and innovative sort of uh, interruptions and, and interventions on this. So this is, and these I, are I, new I, colors. And I also think that, uh, I mean, you were one of the few artists to use it uh, in an abstract with, with an abstract language and also in relationship to the process. That's I mean, true. I think most of the other uh, people who are working with the 20 by 24 were using it in a sort of literal sense uh, as, as a way to describe some literal... Uh, well, it's an interesting uh, camera because it was designed really for portraits, head and shoulders. So we have Chuck Close, and Bill Wegman, of course, Timothy and Neil Sanders. And the apparatus, the negative on the left, is light sensitive. So, and the white receiving paper, which is receiving the dyes, um, is not light sensitive. But I don't think, having been familiar with the camera, I started shooting it in 1983. At that time, the camera was up in Boston. John Ritter was doing a film called Camera Ready about the artist who used the camera. And uh, he reminded me. Uh, I lived in Little Italy in Spring Lafayette. I just got a studio at Spring and Mercer across from Donald Judd. But he did remind me that I did go up to shoot up till 1986, which I completely forgot because that's quite an arduous little trip. If you think of Cindy Sherman's photograph of her on the road with one suitcase, I had two. <laughs> a really big portfolio. Um, and you walked? I walked. Yes, I did. It was really a heavy case, too. <laughs> But I, this, trans, this transition, I started with these sort of neo-geo psychedelic uh, patterns over myself, these multiple exposures. They were so, there was always an experimental uh, uh, reference in my work. And of course, I did my graduate work at SUNY Buffalo, and I did museum studies at the Albright Knox, which has this incredible collection of abstract expressionist minimalist artwork. Um, so my influences, I would say, these would be, you know, our history would be surrealism, Dada, this idea of randomness and chance. Um, I was looking at, I was a picture editor at Mademoiselle for some time when I was just thinking. I know. Paul Bright hired me, great Paul mm -hmm. Bright. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful. She befriended me and gave me a job. 
So I was doing research on these sort of diagrams, fractal geometry. Uh, of course, the circle and the square are the two universal um, codes. But it was after Polaroid, the support program went from 83 to 87. We had the crash in 1987, which was called Black Monday. Um, some of you remember that. Then the Polaroid closed their support program. And that really presented a conundrum for myself. So I went back into the darkroom with the question, a lot of times my projects start with, you know, what does an abstract photograph look like? And I began to look at Talbot, uh, Anna Atkins, uh, you know, cascading spruce needles, looking at Pollock again, and this idea of, you know, is it possible for a photograph to be truly abstract without the sort of uh, cliches of the out of focus. So that investigation began in the late 80s. Um, and then I started doing the stack. I couldn't give up Polaroid. So this has been a question a lot of people ask me. We had Steve Chrome, you probably remember the Steve Chrome, mm -hmm. uh, standing Chrome, and a lot of people were working in color. But I, I couldn't, I, there's a pristine clarity to it. It doesn't have a grain, and it's just a beautiful object the whole process. So I funded myself thanks to my dealer Jane Bowman in the back. We had corporate clients and I got to work. Um, but I think this trajectory towards emptying the frame and doing away with any kind of subject matter uh, certainly was and then the breakthrough was the close in nineteen ninety six. And then keeping the negative and, and then of course I mean part of the dilemma in terms of making an abstract image is with photographic materials is that um, the, the material and the medium is so rooted to the real world that um, even if there is nothing recognizable necessarily in the picture, uh, the question is still always posed for what is it? You know, right. as, as, is, as if that tether to the real world can, can never be severed. That's a do great you, observation. Do, but, yeah. do, but do you feel like you've succeeded? in creating something that doesn't exist on those terms? I hope so. Do people say, well, what is that? Is that, that's is that, good, that's, is that they melting, ask two questions. Is that melting cheese? Or, <laughs> <laughs> or is that like uh -huh. a sunset? Um, I, I think I think the question is posed correctly. You know, what, what is this a picture of? Like. A, addresses this photographic, uh, historical, and cultural, you know, the, the freight of our medium to narrate the document. So my um, practice, my Polaroid practice, is called Photography Degree Zero, referencing Roland Barthes' book, Writing Degree Zero, which is from 1953, uh, Albert Camus, Jean-Paul Sartre. So when that, the French avant-garde in literature came in, in poetry, there was no beginning, middle, and end. So this picture has no picture size. So when you look at Photography, it's so exciting. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine a world without, you know, photographs. Well, we have the iPhone, but, you know, imagine the dark ages of the 19th century where here they are struggling. Oh, the 1970s. <laughs> you know, Talbot, Nana Atkins, they had a great friend with uh, Sir John Herschel. But my picture is, you know, what is the process? So the process becomes the subject. Uh, again, I think referencing probably abstract expressionism, Jackson Pollock offering space, uh, where Pollock took the canvas off the frame and put it on the floor. So he's really a maverick and a pioneer. Um, Who? Jackson Pollock. Pollock is a maverick. Yeah, don't you think? Right? I think so. I hope so. I just I mean, wasn't sure. Yeah, right? Yeah. Jackson. I mean, all those. What do you think memory. about what do you think about Gerhard Richter's paintings? I, the squeegee just, track, the squeegee just, one? The squeegee pictures. I think, <laughs> just looking at your your and if we're talking about the relationship or the transition between representation and abstraction, one can argue that the, that that gesture removing the representation might be somewhat similar to what you're. Well, there is a, a critic in France, I haven't met him, his name is Mark Leno, mm -hmm. and he and I have corresponded, mm -hmm. and he, what he loves about my work is the way that I dismantle the apparatus of photography. Mm -hmm. to what does that mean? Well, I think the way I'm understanding it is that he, that there's no representation. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of collapse of all, um, 
you know, what I would call the freight of metaphor or the freight of the picture side. So there's no landscape, there's no still life. And it frees what Lyle Rexer has also referred to as having the picture just be an object, a photographic object. Well, so, I mean, one could argue that one of the things that all photographs have in common, with the exception of maybe your work and some other people's work, is that it's always referring to something that's not here. Correct. It is always pointing to something that, that, that existed before us. Mm -hmm. Whereas yours, I think, can be apprehended, apprehended as it is in the moment. It does refer to the gesture. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the past, but it also exists very much in the present. Well, and I think with the Polaroid Pulse, which is this photography degree zero, mm -hmm. uh, the negative, I'm very interested in the negative. In as a metaphor and a physical object to the shadow. So you, there's that great book by, uh, they called it Short History of the Shadow in Art, um, an art historian. He's got a chapter on photography. So the fact that as photographers, we have embedded in the characteristic in our medium are certain things. So it is the shadow, so this negative is the shadow image, so to speak, of the process. and. You know, so what is this a picture of? Well, it's true. It doesn't have any recognizable what we call picture signs in it. And then you have to come back and pretend, uh, you know, introduce the paradox or conundrum. Um, you know, so what is this a picture of and how is it made? I think for me, it revisits the wonder of Daguerre and Talbot and Anna Atkins uh, in the 19th century. They must have been so excited. You know, the visceral, physical, the sun picture is using light. Well, I'm, you know, this picture was made with light, without light, so Dr. of the Land, his invention. So photography is a history of method, process, and methods. Right. And well, you mentioned physical. Let's talk about that for a minute, because I just want to go back a little bit to the relationship between your work and the rest of the work in the show, as well as the basic thesis of the exhibition. Dear Dave, I guess. Uh -huh. So how, <laughs> how, how did you think about this work vis-a-vis -vis the new flash idea? Uh, I don't know. I just think of the body when I think of the word. What's that? I think of the body when I think of the word. I think there's something really physical about it, and it takes time. That's another very human aspect of your work. It takes time to really, what is it that I'm looking at? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm personally not sure I need to understand, like I'm not one of those types of, you know, maybe that's because I take photography like that where people are always asking me, what is this? Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's real pretty. Mm -hmm. But I also think your thinking is very visceral, and, and I think perhaps the, you know, the, the, the connection that we're seeking between work is, is instinctual and, and visceral. I mean, I think the, the proportions of the, of the work the, and the orientation, the fact that it is a, a, a vertical image roughly the size of our bodies, I think, mm -hmm. gives it a physical, um, a physical presence that maybe is not discussed that much. As well as just, you know, the, the peeling apart of the, of, of the, of the leaves. That, that's mm -hmm. a, a very strong physical gesture. Mm -hmm. Barnett Newman always said he wanted those paintings to be, you should stand as close to them as you would a person. I mean, you can step back and look at them also and they become more or what you want them to be. You should address them as you do a person. Well, I think that's one of the struggles in photography, in mind. I mean, I think of myself as very much an American artist. So these would be um, sort of uh, inheriting the breakthroughs, the post-World War II breakthroughs in American art, Jackson Pollock, abstract expressionism, minimal art, conceptual art, um, the sea changes in feminism and politics and so forth, earthworks. So I think as an artist, you have that challenge of, you know, I have this commercial box, you know, that's given everybody's photographer, you know, it's 11 by 14 or 16, you know, it can only be a certain size. Well, you know, <coughs> when Saul Lewitt, the conceptual artist, came alive, I was like, no, it doesn't. So size and scale are certainly formal issues <coughs> in my work. So size could be, you know, a crack in a wall or it could be the Grand Canyon. So I think when you scale up, uh, it has to have meaning, of course.
but this idea of the relationship to the figure, I am pulling it. You know, they're called poles for a reason because I am, you know, pulling it through the camera. So. But you've also uh, written and talked about the emotional <coughs> quality of the work, the emotional mm -hmm. genesis of the work. So it's not just a sort of formalist uh, position in relationship to yeah. to mm -hmm. mid-century abstraction. So, Steve, you want me to talk about Okay, that's all right. I did. It's okay. It's public knowledge now. I think what happened, uh, well, my background was the uh, Kansas City Art Institute. I did print make. I was a complete failure in all the other visual fields. All Paint, of them? All of them. Painting, sculpture, ceramics. ceramics. It was quite the existential. Um, I had an aunt who was a nun, and I thought maybe I should be a nun. <laughs> So that, was, that was after the failure in Serenity? <laughs> that was the failure. <laughs> Most of me know in Kansas City was the struggle, the uh -huh. artist struggle. They never really talked about the real struggle. Why did you go to the Kansas City? I was far away from my parents. <laughs> 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 it's like kind of, you know, the big Midwest. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, I'll just go to Kansas City. I don't even know where I want. I was like, uh -huh. okay. Hi, Mom and Dad. Was you know, it in, is it in Kansas or Missouri? It's in Missouri. Okay. But it was great. I was right across the street from the Nelson Atkins Museum. And uh -huh. then I went to Buffalo as part of the avant garde with the Missouri. Well, no, it was great. With the cap card. And mm -hmm. then I was always experimenting, painting on photographs, and scaling up and doing the heroic figure, which, you know. And, but I think what Steve was talking about is. Um, in 1995, my mother was diagnosed with a terminal illness with 40 to 70 weeks to live. And I had a middle brother, John, who was an AIDS doctor, and he had an accident, cracked his skull, and died instantly. So there was the, the twin, twin aspect. I didn't mean you had to tell all that. That's okay, yeah. it's public now. It's in all these okay. interviews. Okay. But how did I get to the pole? How did I get to this abstraction? And my father died two weeks before. I moved to New York and married you. And I mean, there's there like real struggles here, people. You know, I was very, very poor. And I went to the Polaroid studio to, it's on my website, to do uh, a portrait of my family as they existed. And of course, you know, photography and the family snapshot, etc. And I had two black rectangles for my father, mother, and my older brother and I were white. My middle brother was black. And the two um, younger siblings. The negatives were all the same, even if the positives were black or white, the life or death. So I had what Freud called the uncanny. I had this really like metaphysical, strange experience where I was like shivering. I don't know what happened. And I realized I was reading the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. You know, I was struggling. I was in reading, and it was just a big mess. Um, and then I did the poll, the first poll which was white square, and then there was a little bit of a sort of something underneath there, and I said to John Ruder, I said, what is that? He goes, I don't know. And I go, well, let's do it again. And then I did it again, and it was a white rectangle with a black conical loop, so the black conical loop was the parabola. It's the first time this form and shape has been introduced to photography. Um, and then I did an all black one, and I just had this quantum leap that photography, the way I was using it, I gave away all my cameras. I thought they're not describing my experience. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the great thing about photography is it's so immediate. You know, you think of Cartier Bresson as a moment or Talbot's photograph, and you know, the way it can describe, but those cameras. And those films and that tripod was not describing my experience. And that's when I just did photography three heroes. So I just left all the cameras, gave them away, and my students, I didn't I haven't picked up a real piece of film I mean, some people don't even know if I'm a photographer. So that was it. So I had a breakthrough. It was sort of existential and spiritual and physical and you know, it was around death and mourning, so the negatives are significant. In that context, they're allowed to do more and more, and more and more photographs. Moving into color, there was a lot of black, white, and gray, and then around 2000, I started doing a lot of color. So does the negative? I'm again just looking at this. Does the negative represent for you something that is um, uh, 
can't think of the word other than a kind of morbid, without well, the connotations of a of funereal part well, of it? I, or? Think I did grow, grow up Catholic, mm -hmm. so there is the uh, Shroud of Turin, mm -hmm. which if you look at the Shroud of Turin, that is... That's the first photograph. That's what they, they say. Mm -hmm. So there is, um, you know, there are those echoes in my work of the negative and the positive. You know, I think that's what really the metaphors are. You know, I think the negatives, and they're very distinct objects. I mean, they don't even look like they belong together. So, I mean, I don't think that. I mean, I can tell those two, but I think if you looked at them in two different places. So going back to, so there are, are, are there any thoughts about the rest of the work in the show and your relationship to 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 the work? Um, your relationship to flesh, your relationship to queer. Gosh, it's a lot of questions. <laughs> well, take, take one at a time. Well, I don't know. I think it's great. I mean, you know, I had two siblings who were gay. One was lesbian, one was John was gay, and my teacher was gay. I think it's great. I mean, in our school, people were always coming out and talking to me. And I, I mean, I don't think it's, but as a teacher, I do know. Was it conundrum? Mm -hmm. Or culturally? Or, I, mean, I mean, again, just to kind of riff off the topic of the show. The new and, flesh. Yeah. Well, I think what's exciting I, is the digital. I, and I don't think we're necessarily talking about a sexual orientation. Oh, no. I know. We're talking about the object. I wanted to say another thing yeah. that's really attractive in your work um, queer, strange, and unusual sort of right. I think the act of being able to take something and then I think exactly replicate mm -hmm. reality, that's queer. Because mm -hmm. you decided that you wanted to totally queer that event. Mm -hmm. You wanted to remove the camera. You're, mm -hmm. you're double queer, baby. <laughs> 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 um, well, I guess, maybe I'm a little old fashioned. I don't really know anymore. I guess um, it's a challenge. You know, when I read your statement, I thought it was really challenging because I'm thinking about our culture and certainly the information highway of the cell phone, I guess billions and billions of people. I think digital is very exciting. I personally haven't been able to wrap my head around it because I don't think I'm digital native and I don't really know what to say about it, except that I think it's fascinating. But I also think that, you know, a lot of, obviously a lot of this work has a really uh, lovely do-it-yourself mm -hmm. ethos to it. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's disrupting the digital as, as mm -hmm. you have been also. That, you know, that, that, that sense of also being interested in the materials mm -hmm. and doing something improvisational with mm -hmm. materials mm -hmm. and something that might not have a specific meaning mm -hmm. or a specific motivation. Um, I mean, I look at, you know, just this work, this is Dylan mm -hmm. DeWaters, and, mm -hmm. and, and of course, um, immediate question is that they're entirely different. Right. But there's just this sense of pleasure in materials and in, and in the, uh, the, uh, the playing with the materials. Well, I think one thing I've noticed with the artists like Whitney Hubs, a lot of the artists that show at the gallery in LA and the, is, is there a tableau? I think there is a real, the way the digital artists are working with the tableau and they all seem to be uh, embracing sculptural objects within the frame. So I think that's like, I don't even know how they're constructing everything, but they seem to consider the frame quite extensively, I would say, more than other camera based artists who seem to put their hands in there. So they seem to be working this way. So I think that's invigorating. And then also um, the way they're, there seems to be a lot of sculptural. Sculpture. Yeah. Right. Which is, I and again, I think it's a form of improvisational mm -hmm. sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, do you think of your work as being improvisational? Because you don't know what it's going to look like. Well, there's a great uh, book, Robin and Kelsey, this guy at mm -hmm. Harvard just came out with a book called uh, Random and Chance of Photography. So mm -hmm. I guess that would have to mm -hmm. be part of, part of the risk taking when you work with photographs. You kind of, the action takes place before your eyes, you don't see it mm -hmm. necessarily. I guess with digital you see it a little better, or 
certainly, and then you have to, you know, develop the film and look at context sheets. There's a real. But how much can you can control what these what these impressions? I don't even want to call them a photograph, but what these impressions look like. I don't know. <coughs> How much control? Like, yeah. I have a lot of play in the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, people can come watch me shoot, and it doesn't really bother me. Except, you know, when I go in the dark room, I don't like anybody there. But I can. There's different things. Like, this is. You can control the color. Well, actually, this is an experiment because this is two pods mixing. This is a P3, so Polaroid has different color pods, and the pods are these envelopes that contain the dyes. So those drop in between these stainless steel rollers. So again, I'm doing a very unorthodox thing. So I'm taking this sort of uh, army green negative. I can tell that's a P3 negative. So I'm taking a P3 pod and mixing it with a P7. And then I'm offsetting them. So I'm actually borrowing a lot of the traditional, like it's called, uh, you know, in color chemistry, you're, you're reverse processing. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of borrowing, although John Rear would say, you know, I, he, you know, he would say no. But the traditional method in color film mm -hmm. is you shoot, you know, coat of color, and you use C41 or whatever. Here I'm mixing those up. So these are actually new colors. And this sort of organic shape here is the direct experiment of the mixing of the pot. So the black conical loop is gone from about 2010 with the mixing of the pot. I'm reminded a little bit, well, a lot of Marco, a lot of Marco Brewer's work. Mm -hmm. uh, those of you who don't know his work, he's really as interested <coughs> in using photographic materials as, as a form of gesture and a form of mark making. And in particular, there's a series that he did where he took colored paper and he drew a razor blade across the surface and in the process would, would, would emit right. uh, various dyes and various colors. Mm -hmm. and, um. Well, we're doing some, I mean, when I took the black mm -hmm. and white pod, which are very visceral, and mm -hmm. I mixed it with the P7, I had to wear a mask and mm -hmm. the other mask. Well, these are, some of these things are quite, uh, they actually make smoke coming out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, John doesn't want me to do that anymore. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm thinking of this idea of sculpture, and see, to get back to your question about, Oh, New yeah. flashing I, I was thinking about Donald Judd because I think sculpture. Oh gosh. Sorry. Ooh. Sorry. My ears. But I was thinking of Brancusi and the modernists and Picasso, and you know, traditional sculpture had a pedestal. So maybe to think about my work vis-a-vis someone like Donald Judd, where he there was he got rid of the pedestal mm -hmm. and he used plexiglass and aluminum, brushed aluminum boxes, and they were objects. They were physical objects, mm -hmm. sculptural objects, floor. So I think in a certain way that might be a better way to, mm -hmm. you know, where I'm getting rid of clearing the shelf. So to speak. Do, you, do you avoid putting these behind frames <coughs> or putting them within frames? Is that another way to... to just well, I leave that up to whoever owns them. I okay. do like to exhibit them the way I shot them at the Polaroid studio. Which, so, which is this way. <coughs> yeah, so the negatives come out, they're a little bit vis vis right. uh, visceral, a little bit uh, slimy, and they have to dry. <coughs> so that takes 24 to 48. Okay. Well, you know, they're a little... That's nice, yeah. But, 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 but that's also another way of, 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 of avoiding the burden of, of picture making. Yeah. If, it, if it's not a picture, you don't put it in a frame. Right. You put it directly on the wall. So right. it's another pictorial convention that you're Rejecting. refuting. Yeah, yeah. So, to get rid of the apparatus, I also want people to have that experience. I think with, well, we have that new fabulous material, the Dang but it is, they're very expensive to frame, and I just leave that up to the person mm -hmm. who has it. But in all my exhibitions, I don't frame, even my photographs. I want you to have that experience that I had at Polaroid Studio. So, you know. It takes three people shouting at each other to hang it. Oh, it did take you three people. To the left, to the left. No, I'm telling you, it's to the left. <laughs> I think the negative first is a priority, but of course I'm flexible. I mean, people can hang them where they want to. 
Does this work have a title? I, I, well, I this, is called, this is called this is called the pull with mist and offset pop. Hmm. But the whole umbrella concept for my Polaroid work is photography degree zero, mm -hmm. referencing Roland Barthes. And then the umbrella concept for my photographs are struck by light. And then I have dings and shadows in there. Again, the ding is the photographic mm -hmm. taboo, you know, what, you, what people would reject. So I'm using things that really are not supposed to happen. And then the shadow, of course, I'm trying to, you know, use the metaphor or characteristics that are embedded in the medium. I mean, I think it's so fabulous that we get the shadow. I mean, nobody else gets the shadow. Like painters don't, sculptors don't, right? And, and we get the light. And we get the light, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's what, right. What more do you need? Shadow and light. I know. I guess. So photographic color theory. Oh yeah, you got to be No one else gets the shadow. Oh man, if I don't take great light in a photograph, I just can't. And it doesn't have to be the absence. I mean, this is a very minimal, you know, kind of austere. It can be <coughs> the line, you know, it can be lines of the form. The line can be <coughs> um, the absence of the line, the physical line. But I think it's really important to understand all great photographs have some kind of real strong presence of light or absence or combination therein. I'm suddenly struck just looking at these pictures by the, are you okay? Oh, yeah, you know. I just, well, it's okay. I'm oh, suddenly oh, struck right. by the idea of gravity, which which obviously, mm -hmm. you know, feels like such a strong element in, in this piece. And then we also have these the, the, these pictures mm -hmm. that, that it's a stack of something. Mm -hmm. um, so, there's a, to me, there's a sense of, of building something and then also, in your case, just letting, letting something go. Well, the topsy-turvy, I mean, I could see mm -hmm. this piece the other way around. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think you can play with reversal, and that's another great thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is 180, this is the mirror reversal, so to speak, so. Helen, I wanted to ask you also, um, one of the great things about the work that you're doing now is that it has received what I think is a level of support and recognition that is very deserving. Thank you. Um, but you've also, um, your work is now having a conversation with a lot of uh, younger photographers' work, and it seems to be part of the part of the discourse. And, and for those of us who have been around for a long time, you know, it's an argument for simply doing what we need to do. And there are times that people are going to understand it and appreciate it, and then maybe not for a while. But you just, you simply continue <coughs> following your uh, train of thought. Uh, so it's a real accomplishment, and, and I know I'm not alone in, 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 in thinking that. Um, but what, 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 what? I think I know where you're going, so. I, I'm not sure where I'm going, but what a wonderful, also, creative process to have a body of work and a way of working that is suddenly part of a, a, a different conversation. I think that what Stephen is saying is in the 70s, Mm -hmm. You know, our field is only 40 years old. So those of you who are coming in now are sort of seeing our field populated with galleries and blogs and education. I mean, this was not the case 40 years ago when I first moved to New York. There were two galleries, mm -hmm. Light Gallery and Lee Witkin, and mm -hmm. Lee showed mainly Ansel Adams and, you know, you know mm -hmm. books and fat. He's a great guy, and then Light showed street photography. So. I think um, if you wanted to be an art photographer, people sort of looked at you like, hey, that was strange. And, you know, there was Robert Cumming and Wegman and Dwayne Michael. Mm -hmm. and and Lu Lucas Samaras, Lu 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 yeah. thinking about your work and also manipulating the emotion. Mm -hmm. So I think to speak to your, a lot of young artists mm -hmm. are admiring my work. And I just mm -hmm. had a studio visit with That's somebody right. who met. Um, Lefford, Matt Lefford, yeah. Lefford, yeah. yeah, great, okay. great guy. Yeah, so people, I think the question is, the artist struggle. <laughs> you know, that is a question. You all have to answer that yourself, those of you who are picture makers, and that comes in many forms. So I don't think it's just financial, it's time, it's spiritual, it's the struggle. What are you, what are you making? 
Um, <clears throat> and then I think there's just dedication. I mean, I think when I talk to my students, I just say, well, it's kind of like the Olympics. You know, if you want to be a champion tennis player, I mean, you look at Serena Williams, you, you know, look at, I mean, it, it is a discipline, it is a focus, and I just, I, I had great support though. I mean, we, you know, I had a fabulous experience in Kansas City. I had great, you know. Do you, do you learn from young photographers and I from your do. students? I what do. I had this you, one guy who just made a fabulous program the other day. Uh -huh. He's like, wow, he's out there. Mm -hmm. He's distracted. Mm -hmm. I try to keep them to have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. You know, but it does. It is a dedicate. I mean, I think to be good at anything. Um, it takes about the it takes, it takes ten thousand hours. Yeah. Here's what I think. You know, one student in the adult came back, she waited her whole life. Her kids were from just doors. Oh, I can't wait to go get my DFA. She's making her senior show and she's doing this beautiful project. And it's a grid about 25 years of years, blah, blah, And she's like struggling in computer. She's crying. I'm like, what is going on? She goes, I just don't, I, I just, I really want to go and call her girl. It's like, oh my God. So it's like, I have this like, just do what you have to do, but she felt the pressure to do everything digitally. So I think you have to make a commitment at some point to what you want to do. But I also have great mentors. I would recommend John Copeland was a mentor. I do a lot of reading. I do research. I'm doing a lot of research. I made a big discovery in the Ray photograph. I'm doing research on the history of color photography and women. It begins with Anna Atkins. Sarah, Angelina, Auckland, I think you have to, you know, you also have to have fun and live and travel and make mistakes. Just going back to one of your points, um, I found uh, amongst the students that I'm involved with that the more sophisticated the digital technologies become, the more interested students, a certain group of students become in antiquated processes. And, I think and that's, that's, that's been something that's really been a lot of fun to watch. Um, and then, but then sometimes it's a it's a really unpredictable hybrid of something very advanced digitally and then something that is very. When, when did digital come in? I can't remember. Somewhere about ten years ago, I would start my photo one students with photogram and tab and the contact paper print and cliche mirrors. We do a walkthrough, and then I noticed they were really bored, like yawning, like oh. and then there would be the cell phone. And Here's the cell phone. So I thought, okay, wait a second. Okay, this is my competition. Mm -hmm. The cell phone. Mm -hmm. This little object. There. Can you do this on your cell phone? No way. So there's, I, no, there's no app that you no. can do. So I decided now to give them three hours where they absolutely have no time to look at their cell phone. Mm -hmm. And I put in color photography. So the first few weeks of school were three hours. I taught them photographic color theory. They're making photos. They're learning, like red, green, and blue, yellow, and just They're learning. They don't have time. Actually, and this is hilarious, one of my students was with the cell phone documenting the photograms of the wash. I said, what are you doing? There's no cell phone there. He says, well, my roommate, who's a literature major, doesn't believe I'm working. So I'm showing her my work on the cell phone. So I thought, OK, well, that's OK. I had one of my students uh, late last year in my thesis class suggest that rather than having a verbal critique, which is, you know, can be challenging, that we just do it in emojis, that we exchange, you know, that we discuss each other's work in emojis. And, uh, I'm actually warming up to the idea. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to throw my phone with the emojis. <laughs> 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 Thank when they turn that corner, mm -hmm. I want them to have that eureka moment somewhere. So I don't care where they have it, mm -hmm. somewhere no, in their that's undergraduate that's experience. Their choice. Yeah. I just want them to get to it and push through and fall in love. I mean, it's a, it's a love affair, right? Everybody is a photographer. We know it's a love affair, right? Lots of times nobody understands what we're doing, but you don't need that many people to understand what you're doing. It's just like one or two. Well, speaking of people, um, should, we, should, we, should we get some questions uh, from the audience or complaints? Or? I had a question about, um, are you modifying, well, how different are these 20, 24 Polaroids from like a 4x5 Polaroid, physically? 
the size of the sun. Like in the process, it's the same sort of thing you put a pack the same in a principle. holder. It's okay. the same principle. It's just it's just bigger. Yeah. And are you modifying with these pods to an extent before you pull them or while you're pulling them? Well, I do want all them. my secrets. I don't no, know I'm just, like, oh, no. No, I'm just trying to grab the process. Well, can you figure it out? Can you figure it out? No. Oh, okay. Well, no. So, I mean, have you I'm shot confused. on four by five? Yeah. So I'm just confused. Two things. One thing is those are obviously bigger than 2024. Right. So, <laughs> that is confusing to me. The other thing is because you said you're offsetting the pods. Like when I'm shooting four by five, it's just one thing I pull. Right, I can't offset it. Yeah, right. So, so go ahead. Will you shot them again? Well, one thing to know is that the, tw the the film comes in a roll, so okay. it's it's the twenty by twenty four camera. Because usually people just use that on their <coughs> paper, okay. but Ellen is pulling it through. Okay. It's the roll. It's, it's like paper towels. Yeah, no. Rather than using one sheet of paper towels, she's taking the whole thing. And the pods are a separate thing. Yeah, they're 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 in. This is the the whole thing is crazy expensive. We don't even want to talk yeah. about money. Uh, so. I just think about Edward Curtis. Like, did he talk about money when he's out there photographing those Indians? No. Okay. So, <laughs> did he say I'm not going to do this until I have one person show up the mat? No. Okay. So here it is. The pods. Dr. Edwin Land. So the pods are in sealed envelopes. They're chemical dot, uh, dyes to respond to, you know, RGB yellow and So the negatives come down. It's the big camera. You can go on WW20. You can see it. Okay. So the pod, I load, they're in the tray. The pod, like Wegman, all those. Let me call. They just load the whole tray up. Boom, boom, boom. They take oh. pictures. Okay. They throw the negatives away. Ouch. So I know, but I do one pot at a time. For okay. these, I'm mixing the pot. So I'm, I'm basically cross-processing, if you will. That Loosely makes, borrowing. Yeah, no, that makes a lot more sense to me. So and I'm so offsetting the pot. So in 20, wait, 2005. Polaroid, see, every time Polaroid makes a change, I respond. So in 2005, those stand it. I know. Chuck Wells couldn't use them because they had leaks. So then they set them, they sealed them at thirds. So you needed two pods for one exposure. So I'm taking, uh huh. Uh -huh. So I'm telling all my secrets now. Okay. okay. So I'm taking those pods and I'm, instead of doing two this way, they match, I'm offsetting them. And I'm taking a P3. This is a P3 because I can tell the negative, the color. Yeah. You know, it's that ugly green. You know, sort of. But the P6 and the P7 are like a caramel color. So this is a P3 with a P6. Now it doesn't matter which pot goes first, which is second. It's this, it's this. So, and that is a yellow um, uh, filter over the stroke. Oh. But the black and the amber going through the black is the new color. Yes. And then you have the air bubbles on the side. So I'm lifting the negatives that's developing. And you can see that the at the top, you can see there's kind of like little third indentation. That's the seal. So the, the theory behind making them is two separate Polaroid series. One breaks, you just tape it onto the other one. Some chocolate or wet bill or whatever. You have a corporate client, you know, so they're not wasting money. So you are using filters to control the color? Sometimes, or yeah. Rica. So you are actually loading in the camera and photographing? A white board okay. with strokes. So you're. Or over the lens. But so the not lens. Not necessarily, you're not photographing a thing. You're making nothing. exposure with the camera yeah. using that's the, the whole. Process. That's the whole conundrum. Yeah. And there's nothing there. Like with my photographs, there's just light and paper. Yeah. So there's nothing in traditional photographs. There's an object between the light and the paper, which Mid I call. Don't try this at home. I don't, <laughs> have, <laughs> I don't have the means to try this at home. It, you know, I couldn't give it. It's, I call the photogram zero gram, so that yeah. leads to the photography to be zero. So there's really nothing in there. I emptied the frame. Yes, yes, but, you know? but okay, so you've emptied the frame, 
Right. You've taken as much out of the picture as we might expect. Correct. All of that stuff. Right. Yet you're putting these ge- you're putting these marks, these gestures, or, or you're allowing them to to remain there. Isn't that a whole bunch of stuff? It is. It's new okay. stuff. It's new flesh. Okay. <laughs> there we go. It's new flesh. Shout out. <laughs> new flesh. Well, you know, I think abstract expressionism is a, is a challenge. You know, and a lot of people, right? Abstract is an English Sure, color, sure. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Rothko. It was. And it, it was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. But a lot of people still don't understand it. And I think, you know, it's a, right? Well, do, does your work have a relationship in your mind to someone like Wade, Wade, Wade Guitin? Um, yeah, the guy who does the computer process yeah. with the paper. I think he's programming. He's programming yeah. in. He has a kind of recipe and a menu. But but he's also taking this trope right. of abstraction and saying essentially, this is a mechanical gesture. This is not something that's emotional and heroic and, and you know, it's, and in a way, you're, aren't you doing the same thing? Well, yes and no. I have to. I would have to say, Wade, I like his work. I like his idea. Mm-hmm. Here's where I'm gonna. What? Yeah. Materials. Materials have meaning, and I think Wade's materials are a little bit too. Yeah. Okay. In the same way that like Corey Archangel's gradient. Yeah. Things. Yeah. I mean, materials have meaning, right? Anna Atkins. If you study Anna Atkins. It's clear to me, if you look at her botanical studies in those incredibly intricate drawings, and then you look at the science type, mm-hmm. they're mind-blowingly different, okay? The transformation of color, and I'm also going to say, because I'm studying her, that she is a pioneer for abstraction and minimalism in photography, because she'll do something very small. These are not big studies. These are less than 8 by 10. If you've ever seen them, they're quite small. She, the way she uses off-frame space, she's very sophisticated. They can be this big, they can go like this. You know, she's using filigree, her handwriting, so she's introduced word art, conceptual art, the way she arranges it around the page, and, you know, she's got organic, inorganic symmetry, asymmetry, lines, and open forms. So Wade's work, I think those ideas are interesting, but the materials are so... I don't know, there's do, something. Do you find his work simple? No. Okay. No, I think it's a bold idea. I think mm-hmm. it's just a little, there's a material, you know, when you look at a Donald Judd, you could say, oh, it's just like glass and aluminum. Mm-hmm. You could say that. It's the same way I had a friend of mine say to me, oh, Anna Atkins, that's just a, a firm leaf on a blue piece of paper. Mm-hmm. Well. Well, I had a teacher one time that I actually suggested. <laughs> I, I, I think Anna Atkins is abstract also. Absolutely not. She is, absolutely. I would disagree, and we can talk about that. And I'll meet your teacher and talk to her about it. Um, <laughs> we'll, um, get, we'll get the name. I think material, and maybe that's why I struggle with digital, because my friend um, Walter Witt, the children's book, mm-hmm. he always, people want to know why. I've done only one series digitally, it's called these blinks, and they're photograms, and I did them 16, 20, and then I blew them up digitally, and they really. So that's where I'm struggling with digital, you know, is how to work with those materials. Because the history of photography is like hitting lights into the paper. And John Copeland said to me, you can't use color in your work. And I said, why? He said, because the history of photography is black and white. And I said, photography is like hitting lights into the paper. And he said, yes, that's correct. And then I said, Color is light if you look at the rainbow. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm struggling with digital. I, I don't know. I don't know. I just haven't been able to get into those materials. That's what I wonder if. Um, I wonder if. I don't know if I want to say this, but does your work have a certain sentimentality because of its reference to abstract expressions? Or nostalgia, maybe that's a better that's word. That's a good question. I don't Thanks. know if abstraction and photography has been, it's just really Lyle's book. 
Um, abstraction is one thing, abstract expressionism, and you right. know, those particular figures, right. you know, Pollock and Rothko and so right. on. Nobody's ever asked me that question. I don't know. Does anybody else have any? I don't know. Okay. Don't I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the only person I know is uh, in the scholarship area mm -hmm. there is Henry Adams, who is the scholar on Jackson Pollock's relationship to Thomas Hart Benton. Mm -hmm. And he did a book called Tom and Jack, right. The Intertwined Life. And he's, <coughs> he's a new friend. And he and I are friends through my Man Ray Discovery because he thinks in the mural painting mm -hmm. that Pollock's signature is in there, mm -hmm. that he did that first. Yeah. You think so? Okay. Absolutely. Well, it's a little bit of a Francis B. O'Connor doesn't think it is, and he's the Pollock scholar. So anyway, Henry Adams and I have met several times. He's come to my studio. He has looked, now this is a guy who's a modernist. Hmm. He never met a contemporary artist. This is also true of Larry Schaff, by the way, the Talbot scholar. So a lot of these people that are scholars and are historians in other fields, you're like an alien from another planet if you want to talk to them. So what never, happened? He, he, he didn't know what they were. He, he okay. thought they were intriguing. He, mm. he wants to write about them. Good. He kind of has to, he doesn't know what they are as objects mm -hmm. yet. So mm -hmm. that's, the only per that's the only reaction I've had mm -hmm. from a person who's a Pollock scholar of note. Any other questions? More questions? Are there any Pollock scholars here? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all Pollock scholars? I did take a course at SVA but with Monroe Denton called the Art History of Jackson Pollock. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So That's like, a great book. Monroe Denton would be a great I know. But he's quite, uh, if you ever have a chance to meet Henry Adams or hear him speak, he's quite powerful. Um, I would highly recommend getting that book if you're interested. In he really explains it's fun also. It's how fun. Pollock mm -hmm. was influenced by that. Um, they, they're both from the Kansas City, too. A little, you know, Kansas City thing. But that's a good question. What do you think, Steve? Do you think they echo? Do you think they're sentimental objects or harking? Do they look dated that way? I, I, I too, am not sure. I don't think yeah. they look dated, but I just, if I follow my thought process, and listen to your, re you know, you've referenced Pollock in mid-century mm -hmm. abstract expressionism a couple of times, and I think it's very genuine. I think it's something that that, that you genuinely uh, have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. But I, but then I also wonder, well, if you're gonna if you're gonna methodically take everything right. out of the right. picture, then why put that in? Right. And and, and what relationship does does it have? I do have some pictures that have no light in them at all. So that's the photography degree zero part. There's zero exposure. So the lens is, we're just pulling it through. So there's nothing there. Yeah. You know? Are you yeah. talking about the attachment to Polaroid in her work? No. I think he's talking about talking me? No. Yeah. No, I'm talking about the gesture. Okay. Yeah. I think it's really interesting in that especially larger Polaroids, there is more room for gesture within mm -hmm. the creation mm -hmm. of the image. Mm -hmm. And especially like, because you talk about the different mm -hmm. costs, like with smaller Polaroids, it's just mm -hmm. you pull it. Right. It's, it's either it worked right or it didn't, mm -hmm. and you can't control that. Mm -hmm. I think but I think that, you know, to get back to dialogue, the, the, you know, painting and photography have always been you know, in dialogue. And I think of Domier's lithograph of her Paris with Nadar mm -hmm. photographing Paris and underneath it says, you know, photography being elevated to art. Now, when I was in undergrad school and I would tell people I was going to be a fine art photographer, people would say they didn't know what that was, you know. And there was, when I started teaching at the Harvard Art School in 1983, I was hired by Robert Cummings. The other faculty would say to me, Photography is an art, and I think that was the whole, you know, my peer group. Photography movie. is not art. Photography is not art. Mm -hmm. So there is that, there is that dialogue, you know, that sort of parallel. I mean, now of course, y'all are, that's like poo poo, but there are some people who still think that. Well, is your work a reaction to that, in some sense? 
How, how do you mean, Mitch? Could you, could you be a little, I think it's a good question. Could you? Yeah, I'm trying. Uh, I mean, I guess the sense, historically, photography doesn't have any gesture, mm -hmm. like intentional gesture. I mean, if we're talking daguerreotypes and putting emulsions mm -hmm. on stuff, you get a little screwy. But like your, I guess, desire to include that gesture makes it more of an artist, like a piece of art, an artist's intention. I feel like I'm not going to go clear. Um, I think I understand what you're yeah, asking. Yeah, you use your, your, what everyone was telling you, like at the, the root of it, when people are telling you photography is not art, could possibly be traced to the fact like there's no hand in it. Correct. In the same way that sculpture or painting does. Correct. So in a reaction to that, maybe subconsciously or unconsciously or consciously you decided to put your hand maybe not identifiably but there is a hand in that that's a good way to think about it i, I do think go ahead well or another way of saying it is it's a reaction to okay you don't think photography is art i'm yes. sure as hell going to make it look like that. Yeah. <laughs> that's what this guy bart Leno says about my work i haven't met him yet but that's that's what his, his M-A-R-C, a capital L-E-N-O-T. I haven't met him yet, but he did his dissertation, I guess, on, on my work with him. He's from Paris. I haven't met him in the blog. He, he, that's what he said, what you're saying, is that there's an elimination of all the apparatus, all the equipment. You, you don't, it's just, it's just out there free. Um, yeah, and that's what he's saying. To me, it doesn't feel like a photograph. Mm -hmm. I, the work I make is very much rooted within history, mm -hmm. not the history of photography, and using, I mean, inherently, the exact same processes that Wegman made, used, mm -hmm. and the other people in 2024 is totally different. I think we have to also remember that when I came into being a young artist in the early 70s, you know, that the avant garde. You know, I was looking at the avant-garde. You know, I wasn't looking at cow paintings. Not to say that I don't like cow paintings, but you know what I mean. Or, you know. You weren't looking at cow paintings. <laughs> I mean, I love outsider art. You know, I love any art that's done really well. Um, but I think, um, you know, the avant-garde is really where I locate my visual thinking. And for me, you know, when you look at uh, you know, I always love Man Ray and, the, and, and then the freedom, you know, post World War II. You know, what that said to me, I'm an American woman. I mean, I went to school, there was the history of art, Jams of History of Art, there were no <coughs> women artists in there. You couldn't find one, even in the back index. There was no art story. So I wasn't gender coded <coughs> as a child. Um, and, you know, I think my parents believed in education and they just wanted me to go out and do good work. I don't think that's what they had in mind, but, you know, I think <coughs> being an American artist and being female, and there's a lot of discussion around that. I saw Susan Neer just last night and somebody said, how do you feel being a woman artist? And she said, well, you know, I don't like the label, but, you know, there's a lot of, you know, all this stuff around it. I think it's a bunch of nonsense, but of course we know they're great. But I think for me, <coughs> it's the freedom. You know, it's the freedom to work with these materials that just came. They just started being invented. I mean, now it's going to go away next year. So I was in that, that avant-garde, that time when technology and science and photography were coming together. Are you uh, fond of uh, Eva Hess's work? Of course. She's a great artist. I'm sorry she died so you know. She was friends with Song Wen, so yeah. I just think of her in a relationship to that mm -hmm. she, you know, perhaps because she was marginalized mm -hmm. in the art world as a female, that mm -hmm. she was able to utilize, investigate these materials that were that were seen as not being sculptural at the time. The yeah, the rubber, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think of it as like Donald Judd in plexiglass. That was unheard of, right? Well, when I first looked at Donald Judd, I was like, wow, 
It was so interesting because it was challenging and sculpture was not on a pedestal of a class. Plaster and, you know, it's like, where is it? Do you ever think of Klein's work? I mean, especially yeah, the, Klein, the blue. Because yeah. the, the, the relationship between <coughs> the, the female mm -hmm. bodies mm -hmm. that were uh, painted with blue and then impressed upon the paper. Well, you climbed and also that jump from his, uh, the void, the idea of the void, which of course is in the shadow in the negative. So, yeah, I mean, I want to embrace, I also am not afraid to take risks. I mean, a lot of people go into using Floyd's studio and it gives them nervous breakdowns. You know, it's like they're spending money and they can't, you know, they're afraid of it. So I'm not afraid to go out there and, you know, take some chances. I mean, that's the whole job part of the work. Right, right. Chances. Right. Yeah, I just want to, I'm curious, you know, um, Gerhard Richter, who mm -hmm. holds squeegees, mm -hmm. squeegee. Now, I always thought he actually got the idea from the back of the Polaroid that was left over. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. How can I just move that in? Just the fascination of the rest of the that mm -hmm. never crossed your mind with those things. Mm -hmm. Gerhard Richter, I mean, those are actually silk screen squeegees that he's using. So I did study silk screen, and I think he decided to take advantage of another tool. So I would have. I think he ripped you off. Gerhard Richter ripped really? you off. Shame on him. Um, I don't know. You know, I think after Pollock, it's pretty hard. I mean, I wouldn't go. I, I you know. There's a colleague of mine who says I'm a painter. I, I just wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't even go there, really. Mm -hmm. You know, after Jeff and Paul, like, why bother? I haven't really seen any great painting that mm -hmm. much. Those are really fine words. I, I, there, I, I, there, you know, there, there are no painters in the audience. <laughs> you can get, well, away, you can get well, away with it. <laughs> Sorry. I, I mean, if you're going to be an abstract painter, I, it's going to be an abstract painter. We'll do the studio sometime. Okay, all right. I, I'll, I'm happy to look. Um, I, you know, I think it's a challenge. You know, there's some great quantum leaps there, visual thinking, and you know, I look at Man Ray and you know, that and, I mean, there's just some the whole thing I show up there, even though I think it's over a little bit. And, you know, That's a good one. Yeah, I, I just think there's a, some, and not all polyps are great, you know, but when they're great, it just gives me goosebumps, you know. So, I mean, I don't think it's that easy, quite frankly, to do anything. You know, I think Can we give a round of applause for that? Thank you. Like one great picture, you know? You make one, Ralph Gibson said to me, you know, you make one great picture, Alan, and then that's it. I'm like, that's it? He goes, yeah, that's it. So. That was his advice to he you? He just said, you know, if you make one. Oh, okay. If you make one, then that's it. Well, he's You're made, all done. He's made two or three. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So if you make one, two or three, yeah. <laughs> It's not that easy to do, really, right? And Ellen, is there anything else we should cover? I don't know. Is, Anybody have is, questions about the Blizzard of Buffalo in 1977? <laughs> Mary Amy will remember that. Is there anything we've left uh, unturned? Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you all for coming. <laughs>